Just because software is open source, it doesn't mean that the people that make the software don't make any money on it. In today's episode, we'll talk about open source business models. Welcome to Copec Explained Software, the podcast where we make computing intelligible. This week we're talking about open source business models, and we did a prior episode on open source software in general, which I'll link to in the show notes. We assume that our listeners know what open source software is. I'll give a really quick refresher. Open source software is software where the source code is available, but actually the definition goes beyond that. It also means that people can take the software compile it, run it however they want to, on whatever machine they want to. They can study how the program works. They can modify the source code. They can redistribute those modifications. And they can basically do almost whatever they want with the source code as long as they follow the license, which generally just says that they have to give credit to the original creator of the source code somewhere in their about box of their program. Or it might say that they have to also redistribute their changes. So make their software open source as well. That's what we call a viral license. We get into all of this and this definition in our prior episode about open source software. So if you don't know what open source is, do go check out that link in the show notes. But let's get into the business models. Let's start by talking big picture about the relationship between open source software and business. What are some myths about the business side of open source software? Yeah, there are a lot of myths about open source software and open source business models. The first myth is about open source software in general. A lot of people think that open source software by definition is not commercial, and that's just not true. In fact, almost every large commercial software company is involved in open source today. Whether it's Microsoft, Google, Apple, they all contribute to open source software and they all actually have open source projects that they lead. They're actually spending a lot of money on open source. So open source software definitely is commercial. In fact, almost every big software company does a lot of work in open source. The next myth is that people don't get paid to work on open source. Well, these big companies that are involved in open source, they're paying their employees, some of them full time, just to work on open source software. So people get paid all the time to work on open source software. Sometimes companies do it a little bit more indirectly. So they might actually go and sponsor an open source project. And then that open source project, which might actually be run by a nonprofit, may then actually be the one paying for people to work on the open source software. That's not to say that companies don't take advantage of open source software that's out there that people are not getting paid to work on. That definitely happens all the time, but a lot of people are being paid to work on open source software. And then another big myth is that open source software and proprietary software are at odds with one another, that somehow they can't coexist. The reality is they coexist every day on almost every computer in the world. For example, you might be running the Firefox web browser on Microsoft Windows. Microsoft Windows is a proprietary operating system, but Firefox is an open source web browser. There's open source software that you're using on a proprietary operating system, but it goes further than that. Microsoft Windows today has several different open source components. So actually Microsoft Windows itself is a combination of open source software and proprietary software. So that's a big myth. Open source software is all over the place. Our whole world is powered by open source software and it coexists with proprietary software. That's interesting about the myths. I think the general public does misunderstand open as meaning free. Okay, so now we're gonna go through some open source business models. What is the lost leader model? So yeah, now we're gonna get into all these different business models and there's a lot of them and we're not gonna cover every single one, but this first one that you're asking about, the lost leader model, is a very easy one to understand. Here's how it goes. You give away a version of your product, that's the open source version, and then you charge for the professional version or the more advanced version. I'll give you an example of a company that does this. JetBrains, they're a big maker of integrated development environments, basically tools for programmers. They make a lot of tools for programmers. And a lot of their IDEs, there's a free open source quote unquote community edition. 
And that's the loss leader. That gets people in the door. That gets people excited about their products. Then when people want more advanced versions of the products, they have to buy the professional version. And the professional version is not completely open source. It's based on the same open source foundation, but it has some proprietary code in it as well. So that's the loss leader model. You basically want to get people through the door, get people into your ecosystem, get them using your software. And then when they want a more advanced feature or a more advanced version, then they may have to buy a subscription or outright pay for the pro version, quote unquote, of the product. So that's a pretty common model in open source. And we call that the loss leader model. What is the thought leader reputation model? Yeah, this next model is a little bit more nuanced. It's called the thought leader, sometimes called the reputation builder model. The idea is that you're actually doing open source work to build the reputation of your company and to really have it gain some influence in the software world. I'll give you an example of a company that people could argue do this. Apple. Most of Apple software is not open source, but... They have some particular pieces of software, such as the Swift programming language or the WebKit browser engine that are open source. And this gives them some credibility in certain programming communities. For example, a lot of people don't want to work today in programming languages that don't have open source implementations. So maybe it's helped improve the adoption of the Swift programming language, the fact that it's open source. The other benefit of this, which I should mention is a benefit of any open source model, is that they're also getting contributions from outside developers who wouldn't otherwise be interested in their software if it was an open source, and they would frankly have no way to contribute if it was an open source. So this is both good PR, it looks good to be open, and it also might attract some developers to your projects, to your software. It may even lead to some of those developers being future employees. They get involved in one of your open source projects. They love the software you're building. They see you as a thought leader, and then they want to come work for you. So Apple is a company who definitely doesn't go all in on open source, but they do go into open source in some very strategic areas that build their reputation within certain communities. And also, of course, might lead to some helpful contributions coming in from those communities. So literally getting some free labor from the community, helping to improve certain pieces of their stack, but also building their reputation and getting potential employees maybe involved in some of their projects or just getting them credibility with other developers. What is the hardware support model? Yeah, if a company is mainly a hardware company, then maybe they don't care that much about whether or not their software is proprietary. Let me give you an example. Maybe you make graphics cards, such as AMD. AMD is one of the two large graphics cards makers in the world, along with NVIDIA. And maybe as AMD, you really make money selling the hardware. You make money selling those graphics cards. But in order for those graphics cards to work, they need to have drivers. And we talked about drivers, by the way, on a previous episode called What is a Device Driver? And I'll link to that in the show notes. But anyway, you need these drivers to actually make your cards compatible with various different operating systems, including maybe some open source operating systems like Linux or FreeBSD. And in order to have those drivers, you could either develop them completely yourself, which requires a lot of resources, or you could start an open source project where you might get help from the community because maybe there's somebody who's running Linux and they wanna use your graphics card and they wanna use an open source driver. And then by sponsoring this open source project, you might actually be able to sell more graphics cards because now you don't just sell them to Windows users and Mac users who you make proprietary drivers for. You also now can sell them to the Linux community who helps you with the building of the open source drivers. So this might actually lead to more markets for you by having open source drivers, more places where people can actually use your cards, therefore more hardware sales for you. It also might give some users some assurance. When something is open source, it means even if you go out of business, that driver can still be improved and your hardware doesn't become useless. This might especially be more relevant to a smaller company, so not a company like AMD. But maybe there's a small company 
and they're competing in a competitive market. And it's like, why should anyone have to use my product when there's all these big competitors? Well, one of the ways we might give them some assurance, because what if we go out of business, right? Then the hardware is not going to be supported because no new drivers will come out. Well, if we open source it, then the community can go and keep improving on the drivers, even if the company goes out of business or no longer wants to support the product. And so it's a way of giving your user community some long-term assurance that the hardware will continue to be supported because the driver is open source and people can continue to improve on it no matter what the original company decides to do or if it goes out of business. So open sourcing your hardware driver is a way to maybe open up new markets and also to assure the community of long-term support of your devices. Now we're going to look at the largest model, So what is the sell the services model? Yeah, so this is the really big model, selling the services. There are a lot of different kinds of services that you can sell to go along with open source software. Maybe the most common is hosting. Here's the idea. Your product is open source, but to run it, people need a server. Let me give you a big example of this, WordPress. WordPress, which we covered in a previous episode on what is a content management system, which I'll link to in the show notes, powers something like 40% of all websites. That's a huge number. But most people who run a website, they don't want to go set up their own server. They could go to a third-party company that knows how to use WordPress and knows how to set it up and host it well. But why should an automatic, the folks who make WordPress, just support WordPress themselves and offer hosting of WordPress as a service. So this is one of the big ways that open source companies make money is they just charge you for the hosting. When you want to actually use their product, you're going to need a server anyway. Why shouldn't they be the ones with that server? And you just pay them a monthly subscription fee for access to their software on that server. That's one way of selling services. Another way of selling services is to sell support. So your product might be totally open source. Anyone can download it, compile it, run it. But what if something goes wrong? What if something in your product doesn't work well? What if they have a problem with integrating it into their ecosystem? What if there's a bug and they want to have somebody they can call on the phone or somebody they can email or chat with? Selling support is the other big way that open source software companies make money. The last one is a little in the services category is a little bit more nuanced. It's about customization. Sometimes you might call this consulting. So you have an open source product and people want to use it in a very specific way or they want to integrate it with their other existing systems. Off the shelf, if they just download it, this might be hard to do. But you offer services that are probably pretty expensive for customizing the software for a particular use case. This is, for example, how the open source database SQLite works. SQLite is actually released under the most permissive license you can imagine. It's actually having no license it's the public domain. So literally anybody can do anything they want with SQLite. But the folks who make SQLite, they make most of their money on consulting. They make money on people who want to use SQLite in particular ways, paying them, to help them make SQLite work for them in those particular ways. So these are three different big open source business models, charging for hosting, charging for support, and charging for consulting. And all three of those together, we call selling services. So those are the sell the services open source business models. And what about some of the lesser models? How about selling accessories? Yeah, this is kind of a weird model, selling accessories. So you have an open source project, people are using it, and you want to make a little money, so maybe you sell them some t-shirts. They just want to show their support for you, so they go and buy these t-shirts, that makes your software even more popular because it's free advertising, and you're actually like getting some money for all this open source work you do. It's kind of weird. There, Another one that's a little less weird that goes under this accessories model might be selling documentation or selling books. Give you an example of a company who does this, O'Reilly. O'Reilly has actually been very involved in the open source world. They've sponsored open source software conferences for decades. And they, of course, sell books. And a lot of those books are about open source software. It might be about an open source programming language or an open source web server. And they make money selling those books. And they have tons of cred in the community 
because they sponsor open source programmers, they sponsor these conferences. And so, of course, people in the open source communities want to support O'Reilly because O'Reilly supports them. So this can be a legitimate business model. It's a little bit weird compared to these other ones, but selling something like a t-shirt or selling a book or documentation, we call the selling accessories business model. Another unusual model is automatic open sourcing. Automatic open sourcing refers to taking a proprietary product and putting in the license that at some point in the future, it will automatically become open source. There is an actual product that did this. Aladdin Systems had a product called GoScript that in the 90s, they had a license that said, oh, it's proprietary, like don't distribute it for the first few years without a license unless you pay us. And then it's going to automatically become open source after a few years. So the reason for this model might be to assure people the long-term viability of the software. So even if your company goes away, because the license says the software will automatically become open source, it means they will still have access to the software. So this can give people assurance if you're a smaller company. Very unlikely that a large company would do automatic open sourcing. However, there have been companies in the game space, such as id Software, that took some of their older games and made them open source after they'd been proprietary for a number of years. So it does happen with larger software companies. It's a little unusual. This is kind of a strange model, um, but you can definitely see the benefit here about giving people assurance or in the case of id Software, they just wanted to spur innovation and get people excited about their engines and their technology. Any other models our listeners should be aware of? We've only covered a few business models, and there are so many different open source business models. One might be that you have an open source client uh, that allows people to connect to your media services, and you actually charge for the media. So maybe you're a video streaming site, and you have an open source mobile app, but people who use the mobile app have to pay you a subscription to actually get access to the videos that they want to stream. Another open source business model that I believe... Sun Microsystems practiced with Java was to sell certification. So you have another version of Java that you've developed. Is it compatible with Sun's version of Java? Sun open source Java, but maybe then they could sell you, uh, hey, yours is really compatible. It's officially a compatible version and you pay some fee for their certification. Again, these both are not as common as these other business models we talked about, but they are totally viable. They have existed. Companies have used them. And there are more open source business models beyond the ones we've talked about today. These are just ones that um, I know are particularly prevalent. I also want to give a shout out to a book, a very famous book in the open source world called The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond. In that book, he has a chapter on open source business models. And some of these I originally got from his book. So I do recommend that book. I will put a link to it in the show notes. Thanks for listening to us this week. Rebecca, how can people get in touch with us on Twitter? You can reach us on Twitter at Kopec Explains, K-O-P-E-C-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-S. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcast player of choice, and we'll see you next week. Bye.